I'd like to talk to you today for a little bit about the federal war on drugs, or what I like to call the war on the civil liberties of the American people. I would like to explain some concepts and ideas that you may not be familiar with, and perhaps convince you that our current policies of prohibition and imprisonment are not only ineffective, but they're also um, exacerbating the problems that we have in this country with violent crime, and they're also patently immoral. Whenever I talk about the federal war on drugs, I have two main arguments that I like to use. One is the economic argument, and the other is the moral argument. The economic argument basically centers on the concepts of prohibition that create black markets that are um, predictably violent, and the unintended consequences of these laws that our government pass on, you know, on an, un on an unregulated market that there's, where there's still a demand for a product. Um, an example of this would be 1920, the United States government passed the 18th Amendment of the Constitution, um, which was alcohol prohibition, and it, it, it illegal, made illegal the sale and distribution of alcohol. And it was only a short couple of short years before the mafia and organized crime had immediately filled the void in the market for, you know, for filling that demand for alcohol. And by 1925, 1926, Al Capone had risen to become the most powerful man in the United States of America. He had more wealth, more money, more power than even the president. So in, you know, in 13 years, pretty much the, the government decided that their philosophy of legislating morality and prohibiting alcohol wasn't going to work, and they passed the 19th Amendment, which repealed the 18th Amendment, the prohibition of alcohol. You can see the same kind of thing happening today with, uh, with drugs. You know, drugs are prohibited, obviously. They're illegal under uh, certain schedules of, of federal drug law, and, but people still want them, and people still use it. And because there's a demand for it, people are willing to pay for it. And as long as there are people that are willing to pay for something, there are going to be people that are willing to provide it. And because these pr providers are operating outside the law, this creates a predictable uh, criminal-type atmosphere where people will fight. They will perform violence to maintain their territory because there's no legal regulatory avenue that they can go to to protect their property rights and to protect their business structures. So, for example, if you know, somebody standing on a corner in Baltimore, like in the wire, and they're, they're dealing their service, they're, and somebody else comes along and decides to take over their corner, there's no legal avenue that, of, uh, that they can go to to protect their corner other than resulting to violence. And there's no avenue that the people that want the corner can go to other than resulting to violence. And this is why you see what, what, what you're actually seeing when you see these documentaries on gang violence and drug violence is, is it's just... Um, these people uh, fighting each other for territory so they can turn more profit. But the simple simple fix to this is if you could just sell a, a joint in a Walgreens, nobody, nobody is going to go buy joints on the side of the road from a potentially violent vendor if they could walk into a Walgreens and buy the same joint, and quite honestly, at half the price. So this is the economic argument for the legalization or the end of, of prohibition. The other argument briefly is what uh, you know I call the moral argument and this is based around a philosophy of self-ownership and self-ownership says that you know you own yourself obviously I'm, I'm Ryan Treat um, I own Ryan Treat I have a, a monopoly on the ownership of Ryan Treat and nobody has a higher moral authority over what I do with my body than than I do as long as you know as long as I'm not hurting anybody else so if I decide to smoke a joint um, nobody has a higher authority over me to say whether or not I can or cannot smoke that joint. And that includes even if a bunch of other people get together and they all decide that it's wrong for me to smoke the joint. Well, if they're all together, they still don't have any more authority over the ownership of my body than I do. So basically what I'm saying is if everybody gets together and votes to make a law that says that Ryan Treat can't smoke a joint, well, they just simply don't have the moral authority to do that. Um, another big issue is the drug war, and I'll just touch on this briefly because this is going to be a short video, but the drug war is big money for the elitists. The banks get to launder this drug money, $500 billion a year changes hands in the sales and distribution of illegal drugs. The arms industry gets to sell their arms to drug cartels and drug gangs you know, in L.A. and Chicago, but also in Mexico and Central America and South America. So there's big money. Big money for the arms industry and drug prohibition. 
the prison industrial complex, they get a steady supply of slave labor. They get a steady supply of tax dollars. Um, big oil, they don't have to compete with uh, hemp. Big pharma doesn't have to compete with marijuana. You know, uh, oil and pharma and the prison industry and the arms industry, they all send, you know, spend millions of dollars a year sending lobbyists to Washington, D.C. so they can lobby for the, the continued practice of these drug prohibitions. Because why? Because it's profitable for them. So, you know, government and these giant corporations, they don't really care about you. They don't really care about whether or not you smoke marijuana. What they care about is whether or not they can make money off of it. Um, and, in the, in the, and in that same vein, there's a lot of people whose job it is to fight this drug war. They get to wear costumes and wear badges and run around feeling important because they're fighting the war on drugs and, you know, help. they think they're helping people. And uh, unfortunately, these people with their badges make a lot more money typically than the, than the average worker who actually pays their salary. But the list is endless for the... Uh, the systematic reasons why prohibition is still in place and but the truth is it's just a business that's being sold as a moral issue so what can you do um, I think starting with uh, marijuana is obviously a good incremental step to take so in your state look for a referendum movement if there's not one you can start one but chances are there's already a legalized marijuana legalized hemp referendum movement in your state so that the minimum what you could do is sign sign on to the referendum, you know, add your voice, add your name to the to the to the vote. Um, you could get involved, you can go to rallies, you can become a local organizer. I assure you that the the uh, organization is already there and they're looking for volunteers. So if this is something you're interested in, um, it wouldn't be too hard to get involved. Something that a regular citizen can do that that I actually consider your duty is uh, uh, something called jury nullification. And the concept of jury nullification is basically if you're serving jury duty and you are asked to vote guilty or not guilty uh, for a crime that somebody has supposedly committed and you feel that the crime that they're being charged with is shouldn't be a crime for example if somebody's caught with a half an ounce of marijuana and they're looking at five years in prison and you're told to vote guilty or not guilty um, you could vote not guilty on this potential crime because you feel that the law is immoral or the law is incorrect. Now the judge isn't going to inform you of this, the jury's, uh, the bailiff's not going to inform you of this, the lawyers are not going to inform you of this, but that doesn't change the fact that jury nullification is absolutely your right. For example, if I were to be picked to serve on a jury, um, I would never vote guilty for anybody that didn't commit a crime that affected either a damage to person or a damage to property or um, uh, potentially fraud. So all of these victimless crimes or something that could easily be nullified by jury, you know, by through the process of jury nullification, and it, and it just doesn't, you know, you could actually be saving a life. You could be saving the life of somebody who might otherwise be spending five years in prison, who might come out as a violent criminal, who might go on to murder somebody, because that's what happens when nonviolent people are put into the prison industrial system. They come out as violent criminals. So that's just a few real quick ideas about the drug war. Some uh, some food for thought for my class, um, speech thirteen twenty one. Dr. Morris, it's been a pleasure, and I'll catch all you guys later.